Hello and welcome back to my ongoing series of videos covering Dr. Serafini's A Cardiologist Examines Jesus. Today's video concerns Chapter 2, the Eucharistic miracles that occurred in Buenos Aires in the 1990s. A key term that I'm going to be using in today's video is something called testing into compliance. If you don't work in the sciences or a STEM-related field, you may not know what testing into compliance is or why it's a big deal, so I do have a document that I would like to share with you. This is a document put out by FDA, so you can see on the bottom it says the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Food and Drug Administration. This is from October 2006, and it's called Pharmaceutical CGMPs, Current Good Manufacturing Practices. GMPs, good manufacturing practices, are a huge part of anybody who works in pharma's job. Uh, and whenever you work in pharma, you need to make sure that the drugs that you're working, uh, the, the drugs that you're working on, the drugs that you're testing, that they actually work. And how do you do that? You do that by following current good manufacturing practices to make sure that the drug does what you think that it does. I'm going to be scrolling down to page eight. FDA inspections have revealed that some firms use a strategy of repeated testing until a passing result is obtained, then disregarding the OOS results, the out-of-specification results, without scientific justification. This practice of testing into compliance is unscientific and objectionable under current good manufacturing practices. The maximum number of retests to be performed on a sample should be specified in advance in a written standard operating procedure, or SOP. The number may uh, vary depending on the variability of the particular test method employed, but should be based on scientifically sound principles. The number of retests should not be adjusted depending on the results obtained. And so why is this important? Imagine that there's a company that produces a drug that says this drug is going to cure cancer. Uh, and so they give it to, to somebody and their cancer doesn't go away. They give it to a third person, their cancer doesn't go away. They give it to a fourth person, their cancer doesn't go away. They give it to a fifth person and hey, their cancer goes away. And then they publish a report saying, hey, look, the drug works. We gave it to somebody and their cancer went away. That's testing into compliance. It's counting the, his, the hits and ignoring the misses. I think that Dr. Castagnon Gomez, the lead investigator of the investigation into the Eucharistic miracles at Buenos Aires in the 1990s, is guilty of testing into compliance. And in today's video, I'm going to explain why. If you're not familiar with how the events unfolded in Buenos Aires between 1992 and 1996, I suggest that you watch the first video that I did on this topic close to two years ago now. But for the sake of today's video, I'm going to skip everything that happened up until 1999, three years after the last of the Eucharistic miracles that were occurring at Buenos Aires in the mid-90s. Why 1999? Because it was in 1999 that the investigation headed by Dr. Castagnon Gomez took shape. There was a new archbishop in Buenos Aires, a nobody named Jorge Mario Bergoglio, should sound familiar, and Dr. Castagnon Gomez was a clinical psychologist slash paranormal investigator, and he approached Archbishop Bergoglio asking permission to investigate the Eucharistic miracles of Buenos Aires. Only two samples were made available to him. One sample was from the 1992 host, and one sample was from the 1996 host. Both samples, the 1992 and the 1996 hosts, were shipped to a lab in California called Forensic Analytical. They were shipped on October 21st, 1999, and Forensic Analytical published a report on May 1st, 2000, signed by Venora M. Keene, Ph.D., in which she said, regarding the 1992 sample, a preliminary blood identification test yielded a negative result. As in, this stuff is not blood. Some pieces were sent off for DNA analysis. A small amount of human DNA was detected, although the DNA profiling analysis failed to identify any of the standard STR sequences. 
Regarding the 1996 sample, this one was also sent off for DNA profiling. Once again, a small concentration of good quality, high molecular weight human DNA was isolated. However, PCR technique failed to identify and replicate any of the 10 standard genetic profiling markers. Notably, too, even if the DNA was reported to be of human origin, the final report could not but hypothesize a non-human origin for it, as, once more, no human DNA profile could be determined by means of standard STR analysis. Also regarding the 1996 sample, no known morphological features could be recognized. So they didn't think that this was part of an organ at all. The leftover material from the two samples were sent via FedEx on March 2nd, 2000 to Dr. Robert Lawrence of Delta Pathology Associates in Stockton, again in California. Dr. Serafini says that the sample that grabbed the researcher's attention was the 1996 one, which to me says that the there was just nothing remarkable about the 1992 sample. There was really nothing that could be done there. But regarding the 1996 one, uh, Dr. Lawrence in California did find white blood cells that um, I, I find that quite astonishing. How white blood cells could have survived this long uh, is, is pretty remarkable. However, Dr. Lawrence suggested that the material that he was looking at was epidermis, skin cells, and not just any skin cells, but the most superficial layer of skin cells. You could see here that we went from no known morphological features to skin cells. Well, clearly this wasn't good enough for Dr. Castagnon Gomez because Dr. Castagnon Gomez then sent the slides to several professors and doctors in Australia. Dr. Peter Ellis at the University of Sydney and Dr. Thomas Loy at the University of Queensland confirmed Dr. Lawrence's interpretation about the epidermal origin. They both thought it was skin cells. In Sydney, however, Dr. John Walker believed that it could have been muscle tissue. So you can see here that it has been showed to five scientists so far. The first said no known morphological features. Then we got three in a row of skin, and then one, it could be muscle. This wasn't good enough for Dr. Castagnon Gomez, who was insistent on testing into compliance. So he figured it's time to bring out the big guns. Dr. Castagnon Gomez sent the sample to a certain Professor Linoli in Arezzo, Italy. The same Dr. Linoli who worked on the miracle of Lanciano 25 to 30 years prior to the work that he was about to do on the, the sample from Buenos Aires. Why are we seeking out scientists who've worked on Eucharistic miracles before? It's almost like we're trying to hand select scientists who will give us the answers that we want. And sure enough, Professor Linoli said it was possible that this could have been myocardial tissue. Still not satisfied, Dr. Castagnon Gomez sent the sample out one last time. This time to Professor Frederick Zugaba, Chief Medical Examiner and Cardiologist in Rockland County in New York. On April 20th, 2004, the investigators, part of Dr. Castagnon Gomez's team, met Professor Zugaba in Professor Zugaba's New York office, and the microscope slides were presented to Professor Zugaba. Professor Zugaba said, I am a heart specialist, the heart is my business, and this is heart muscle tissue coming from the left ventricle near the valvular area. He then went on to talk about how the, mu the, the muscle uh, tissue looked like it belonged to somebody who uh, was subject to prolonged resuscitation maneuvers or resembles uh, what he finds in someone who has re received severe blows to the chest. And you're telling me that Professor Zigoba had no idea that this came from a Eucharistic miracle. An investigation team shows up at your office with a sample and they're not going to tell you about it. And it's been looked at, though, by Professor Linoli. I mean, you know, who knows if Professor Zigoba knew this. But you're telling me that Professor Zigoba didn't have any idea? I find that really hard to believe. Notably, Professor Zigoba's reputation was so strong that five years later, on February 28th, 2008, at a meeting in San Francisco, Dr. Lawrence admitted to having made a mistake and acknowledged that the tissue was definitely inflamed myocardium, heart tissue. Huh. If you ask me, Dr. Lawrence was afraid of scandalizing people. By 2008, 
the urban legend of these Eucharistic miracles had grown. People were talking about them now. Imagine that Dr. Lawrence came out and said, nope, definitely skin. That would cause scandal. And I imagine that there was pressure on Dr. Lawrence, despite the number of skin cell readings being three and myocardium being two, if we count linoli, skin still outweighed heart. But I think that the fear of scandal caused Dr. Lawrence to say that he made a mistake when that's not what he was saying when he actually looked at the samples himself. This whole thing seems to me to be a very flagrant case of testing into compliance. If a pharma company did this when testing their medicine for efficacy, and if they were caught, executives would wind up in jail and the pharma company in question would need to pay millions of dollars in fines to FDA or whatever other regulatory agencies were involved. To just keep searching for second opinions and third opinions and fourth opinions and fifth opinions until you get the answer that you want and then to claim victory? This should be deeply concerning to anybody who thinks that the church should be rigorous in her investigations of these kinds of events. And to be clear, I do think there are surprising things about the Buenos Aires host, just like I did with Lanciano. If you want to read about some of those surprising things, like the survival of the, of the white blood cells that I mentioned earlier, pick up a copy of this book for yourself. Honestly, it is a good book. It's worth the read. And the Kindle edition is like $10 or something. But all in all, I think it's quite clear that this case is far less supernatural than f some folks like to make it seem. Okay, now I would just like to quickly talk a little bit about um, the way that I framed this chapter makes it very clear that I think that it's testing into compliance. The author of this book, Dr. Serafini, absolutely does not think that testing into compliance is something that happened here. Well. He never says that anyway. On page 49, he even says that the presence of live and suffering myocardial tissue was confirmed in the 1996 samples. So clearly Dr. Serafini, the author of a, a cardiologist examines Jesus, does not share my skepticism or my concerns about testing into compliance. He does share some of my concerns though, namely my concerns about Dr. Castagnon Gomez. I'm going to make a separate video to cover this, but I think that Dr. Castagnon Gomez is a complete nut. Dr. Serafini seems to have reservations about Dr. Castagnon Gomez, and I will go into those in the next video, but Dr. Serafini does seem to trust Dr. Castagnon Gomez, at least as far as the Eucharistic miracles in Buenos Aires go, as well as the Eucharistic miracles in, at Tixla, which I, I will be talking about in another future video. You can see that I have my work cut out for me here. But I, I do think that it's important to, to talk about Dr. Castagnon Gomez, not because I think that character assassination has any place in science, but because if your work isn't peer reviewed, you're not doing science in the first place. And so I do think that talking about Dr. Castellan Gomez in light of the fact that his work is not peer reviewed is a fair game. Just like with chapter one, two, peer review was never mentioned in chapter two. It's not mentioned that none of this work was peer reviewed. I mean, it's hardly even like scientific work at all. Like the quality of the work done in Buenos Aires is worse than that of the work done at Lanciano, at least in my opinion, but I'll let you be the judge of it. Do you think that Dr. Castellan Gomez was testing into compliance here? Do you think that it's safe to say that it's definitely heart muscle tissue, given what we've seen in today's episode? Let me know in the comments down below, and I really look forward to making those videos on Dr. Castellan Gomez and then eventually Tixla and the other Eucharistic miracles after that. Thanks, everybody.